troibo ad altare dei. Ad deum quita forget you ventida meam. These are the first of the alternating lines recited by the priest and the altar boy at the foot of the altar at the traditional Latin Mass. Translated to English, after the priest says, I will go to the altar of God, the altar boy responds with, To God who gives joy to my youth. That a youth or boy assisted at the Mass by serving the priest at the altar is a practice which goes back to the earliest days of the church. And the history of these altar boys is the topic for this episode of Catholic History Trek. God bless America. God love you. I want these to be my first words of greeting to you. They will be the concluding words on each broadcast. I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president. Annuncio office. God remind you. Abemus papam. You've embarked on a Catholic history trek. In the early church, the priest offering the sacrifice of the Mass was assisted by men ordained to the minor orders of the church. You can hear more about the history of the Mass in episode 33 and the history of the minor orders in episode 14. Originally, one was permanently ordained to a minor order but throughout the ages, the orders became more like stepping stones in a progression to the priesthood. After receiving the tonsure, the progression was through the minor orders of porter, lector, exorcist, and acolyte, and then through the major orders of subdeacon, deacon, and priest. The highest of these minor orders, the acolyte, dates back to at least the 3rd century, when it was mentioned by both St. Cyprian and Pope Fabian. Also, the early church historian Eusebius mentions them being present at the Council of Nicaea. The earliest duties of the acolyte are recorded to be consisting of lighting candles on the altar, carrying candles for processions and during the proclamation of the gospel, preparing water and wine for the sacrifice of the Mass, and carrying the Eucharist, such as administering it to Christians who were imprisoned and unable to attend the holy sacrifice of the Mass. This last role, which was often performed by the deacon, brings us to the martyrdom of St. Tarsisius, a patron saint for altar boys. During one of the 3rd century persecutions of the Catholic Church, the 12-year-old Tarsisius, often believed to have been an acolyte, went out in place of a deacon to administer the Eucharist to some of the Christians who had been condemned to die in the persecution. While on this mission, he was approached by a heathen rabble who attempted to take the Eucharist from him. Instead of surrendering the Eucharistic body of Jesus, he sacrificed his own life defending it, becoming a martyr for the Eucharist. Around the time St. Tarsisius lived, catechetical schools had emerged as the oldest form of Catholic schooling. As covered in episode 49 on the history of Catholic schools, these catechetical schools flourished around the middle of the second century as a way to provide an education free from the pagan philosophy and religion which saturated the culture of imperial Rome sort of a very distant forerunner to Catholic schooling in America, which arose in response to the anti-Catholic curriculum prevalent in the Protestant-run public schools of the day. By the year 180, we find an example of these catechetical schools not only teaching higher branches of education, but adding elementary education. And as Christianity spread through the empire, so did Catholic schooling opportunities for boys. The Council of Aeson in 529 instructs priests to take them into their homes and teach them to chant the Psalms and study the Holy Scriptures. And in the 9th century Synod of Mainz, a similar decree was made that every priest should have a cleric or boy read the epistle or lesson to answer him at Mass, and with whom he can chant the Psalms. Interestingly, when I took high school Latin, I learned the word boy is translated to Latin as puer, but in this Latin text on this instruction from the Synod, the word scholarum is used. Coming from the Latin word scholaris, meaning a student or scholar, these boys chanting the Psalms and offering the responses at Mass were students, most likely young students studying for the priesthood. This practice continued through the Middle Ages with the growth of monastic schools and cathedral schools. Attached to monasteries and cathedrals, these schools trained the boys who were ordained acolytes as seminarians and novices for the religious life. 
The priest offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass and these acolytes assisting the priest were both ordained in the orders of the Catholic Church. But not every parish church had access to acolytes training for the priesthood, and so in time it became necessary that a layman would be designated to the role of acolyte. But with many men being busy working to provide for their families, and young men also working in that regard or being called to war, it fell upon the young sons of these laymen to serve as the acolytes. And even if these altar boys were not officially ordained acolytes, there still remained a close connection between them and the priesthood as their role as altar boys was a preparation for the priesthood and served as a successful means of fostering priestly vocations. Their service at the altar also provided the same assistance that the acolyte provided, namely, offering the responses at Mass, a role which they still serve today at the traditional Latin Mass, and the tasks of lighting the altar candles, carrying the candles, and preparing the water and wine for the sacrifice of the Mass. One additional task of the altar boys, which has an interesting history of its own, is ringing the bells at the consecration. These bells were introduced around the 10th through 13th centuries, primarily to highlight the consecration, the moment when Jesus became present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. But these bells were also practical, with the canon of the Mass often prayed in a low voice, and the design of some medieval churches creating a large gap between the altar and the congregation, it could be difficult for the congregation to know when the consecration was taking place. To this end, the ringing of handbells was only one of several experiments the church tried during this era to emphasize the consecration. Father Matthew Ernst, professor at St. Joseph Seminary in New York, highlighted some of these in an article for Archways magazine. In addition to the small bells, various churches also incorporated the ringing of the large church bell in conjunction with the small handbells. In the 12th century, the priest began elevating the host following the consecration. In France and England, a dark curtain was sometimes drawn to provide a backdrop upon which this elevated host could be seen more clearly. And in some places, a candle would be lit to illuminate the Eucharist at its elevation. Also, thurifers were instructed to reduce the use of incense during the canon so it would not impede viewing the consecrated host. Altar boys and acolytes continued to use the bells for the next eight or nine centuries, but they fell out of use in most Catholic parishes following the introduction of Pope Paul VI's new Mass in 1970. Usually seen as the trappings of a more traditional and reverent time, they were discarded along with communion rails and high altars. Arguably, they had also become unnecessary. With the priest turned away from Jesus in the tabernacle and instead facing the people, it became easier for the faithful to see what was happening at the altar and to hear the priest. Although the bells can still be found today, they are used in the Latin Mass and in some Novus Ordo parishes. The general instruction of the Roman Missal allows for their use in the new Mass. In section 150 it reads, A little before the consecration, if appropriate, a minister rings a small bell as a signal to the faithful. The minister also rings the bell at each elevation by the priest, according to local custom. Perhaps the first altar boy, as recorded in the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, was the young boy who assisted the high priest Jesus by offering the five barley loaves and two fish for the miracle of the multiplication of the food to feed the 5,000, which was a prefiguring of the Eucharist. From this unnamed lad to St. Tarsisius to the altar boys trained in the catechetical and monastic schools and into the 20th century, altar boys were consistently boys, or young men, as a training ground for entry into an all-male priesthood Ordained acolytes and altar boys were always male. As Pope Benedict XIV wrote in his 1755 encyclical, Alate Sunt, Pope Gelasius in his ninth letter to the bishops of Lucania condemned the evil practice which had been introduced of women serving the priest at the celebration of Mass. Innocent IV strictly forbade it in his letter to the Bishop of Tusculum, stating, Women should not dare to serve at the altar they should be altogether refused this ministry. And we too have forbidden this practice in the same words. But this tradition, which traced its origins to the beginning of the church, was changed in 1994 with the introduction of female altar boys, or, as they were renamed, female altar servers. <laughs>
The roots of this change also go back to Paul VI. In 1972, he eliminated five of the seven minor and major orders, leaving only the orders of deacon and priest. The pontiff replaced these five orders with two new ministries of reader and acolyte. The reader is essentially the lector or cantor, and the acolyte who assists the priest and deacon at mass is basically the altar boy. The priest acts in persona Christi, and as such, the church has always had an all-male priesthood, and those ordained to the orders which led to the priesthood were also male. But when Paul VI demoted the minor orders to simple ministries, he divorced them from the priesthood. As such, the Pope opened the door for girls to serve as acolytes, and consequently shut the door for service at the altar being a place to build vocations to the priesthood. And while this door was opened in the early 1970s, it wasn't until 1994 that female altar servers were officially approved by Pope John Paul II. The Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments followed the Pope's approval by issuing a document to this effect. The document explained that it would be up to each individual bishop to make the prudential judgment for his diocese if he would implement this change. And further it stated, it will always be very appropriate to follow the noble tradition of having boys serve at the altar. As it is well known, this has led to priestly vocations, and the obligation to support altar boys will always continue. Following this 1994 permission, most American dioceses were quick to implement female altar servers, and when the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia allowed for them in 2006, the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska became the only diocese to not allow female altar servers. And today in 2023, following the directive that it would be for each individual bishop to make this prudential judgment for his diocese, Lincoln remains the one and only diocese out of the 194 in the United States, which has not allowed for female altar servers. It is perhaps not a coincidence that Lincoln is also consistently ranked as one of the best dioceses in the United States at developing priestly vocations. The Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate out of Georgetown University found that in over two decades of conducting surveys on priestly vocations, Lincoln was the only diocese to rank in the top 20 every time they measured the ratio of ordinands to Catholic population. In other words, when looking at the percentage of their Catholic population who enters the seminary and becomes a candidate for the priesthood, Lincoln, and Lincoln alone, consistently ranks in the top 10%. Whether they are called altar boys, altar girls, or altar servers, today they can be found lighting the candles on the altar, carrying candles for processions, carrying the cross, helping collect and present the gifts, primarily the wine and water in the cruets, assisting with the lavabo, using the thurible for incense at solemn occasions, holding and carrying the Roman Missal for the priest, holding the patents during the distribution of Holy Communion, and so on. This is a continuation of the duties of the acolytes of the early church, and as such, servers today are named acolytes. Although in the solemn high mass with its smells and bells, as they say, there are often many servers, each with distinct roles. Altar boys at the traditional Latin mass will be familiar with the MC, or Master of Ceremonies, the Acolytes, designated AC1 and AC2, the Thurifer, the Crucifer, and any number of torchbearers, all of whom execute their assignments with military precision. Beginning in the 19th century, sodalities, or brotherhoods, of altar servers were established to help train the altar boys with these duties and to form them in good character and virtue. The oldest of these is the Knights of the Altar, which was conceived by St. Dominic Savio and Joseph Bongiovanni. Following Savio's death in 1857, Bongiovanni officially formed the Knights the following year, which is sometimes attributed to St. John Bosco, who promoted the sodality. Their stated purpose was to form a worthy honor guard for the divine Eucharistic King by becoming Knights of the Altar, and to render faithful and reverent worship through their assistance to the priest. They followed basic requirements such as arriving on time to serve Mass, a dress code for Mass, and to be of superior character and pure of heart. Another sodality formed around this time was the St. John Birchman Society. Created by Jesuit priest Father Vincent Basil, the group was named for a fellow Jesuit, the young John Birchmans, who died at the age of 22. Similar to the Knights of the Altar, 
The St. John Birchman Society also had a rule of life for the altar boys to follow, including no fidgety behavior at Mass, learning the responses of the Latin Mass by heart, and saying them both distinctly and devoutly, frequent reception of Holy Communion, praying a set list of daily prayers, and attending a monthly catechism class led by the parish priest. Other altar boy sodalities include the Guild of St. Stephen, which was formed in England by Father Hamilton MacDonald in 1905, and in the United States, Father Francis Benz formed an American version of the Knights of the Altar in 1938. One thing acolytes, altar boys, and altar servers all have in common is they have assisted the priest at the sacrifice of the Mass. And while I'm not an ordained priest, and this podcast is clearly not on par with the Mass, I will ask you to assist Catholic History Trek by taking a moment to leave a rating or review and subscribing to the podcast and sharing it with others, especially sharing it with any former or present altar servers you may know who might be interested in the history of their liturgical role. To end our episode on the history of altar boys, I thought it would be right and just to end with some of the prayers offered by the altar boys at Mass. My son is going to assist me with these, which are the final set of alternating prayers and responses between the priest and the altar boy at the foot of the altar from the Latin Mass. Deus tu conversus vivificabis et plebs tua matabitur in te ostende nobis domine misericordiam tuam et saltari tuam de nobis Domine, exaldi orationem. Et clamor meus ad te veniat. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Thank you for listening to Catholic History Trek. You can reach us at catholichistorytrek at gmail.com. <laughs>